beliefs, what you see is that they're absent in folks who are suffering from uh, major depressive disorder or something like that. So, um, so going back to this optimistic bias, uh, a lot of times people will underestimate the amount of risk that they're facing. So you would see this that uh, for uh, someone who goes to Las Vegas, for example, we have this illusion of control. And uh, we think that we have more control over our lives than we actually do from a realistic perspective. And so most people, if they rate how at risk they are for certain things, uh, they think that they're less at risk than the average person out in the population. strategies is some uh, different methods that people can use to deal with stress. So uh, one useful strategy is positive reappraisal. So when something bad happens to you, there are different ways that you can think about that, aside from just the attributions that you make. So someone can just focus on all of the negative aspects of this event, or they can try to find some good in what has happened. And so, granted, this can be kind of challenging sometimes, but there are a lot of negative events that do have some type of good associated with them. Even when you're talking about something like uh, a death in the family, uh, sometimes you'll have someone who was really suffering for a long time, like if they had cancer or something like that, and uh, then they, they lose their struggle with cancer, so someone with a positive reappraisal would say, well, you know, at least they're not suffering anymore. So there's some good in what's happening. It's a bad situation, but we can look at this in kind of a positive way. Um, likewise, if somebody, uh, say they're trying to get a job and they have an interview at some place that's really far away, uh, and then they don't get the job, they can still look at the positive side and say, well, you know, now at least we won't have to relocate and we don't have to deal with all the other hassles that would have come from getting that job. So, uh, those are just a couple of examples. Then there's problem-focused coping. So some people, when they're confronted by some problem, uh, just freak out and panic, and they don't do anything to actually solve the problem. But that's what problem-focused coping uh, suggests that we avoid. So, rather than just sitting there and stressing out about it, uh, address the problem. Say, all right, what can we actually do to remedy the situation? And just actually working toward a solution can make people feel a lot better and make it easier for them to deal with that stress. Uh, and then finally, I, I like this last one, uh, creating positive events. So it's useful sometimes for people to just take a break and do something that they enjoy. And you can actually apply this in a couple of weeks when you've got all your final exams. If you're feeling really stressed out and like you can't deal with it anymore, just take a 15 minute break and do something that you like. Eat one of your favorite foods, sit back and watch an episode of one of your favorite TV shows, and that you'll actually come back really refreshed and better able of dealing with all the stress of final exams. So, oh yeah, <laughs> sorry, I forgot my bullet point there, yes, just do something that you enjoy, one of your favorite things. So, any questions about these uh, coping strategies? All right, uh, next we'll talk about uh, managing emotions. 
So some people use a strategy of emotional inhibition. And when they feel a lot of anxiety, they don't tell anybody else and they keep it really bottled up. But this is actually fairly unhealthy. So uh, it can lead to chronic arousal. So and even if they are able to deal with whatever was stressing them out, they'll still feel a little upset, so feel some residual stress. <coughs> so, I think I may have mentioned this back in the emotion chapter, but uh, emotions serve a very social function. So, uh, they really <coughs> communicate to other people how we are feeling. So, when you see someone who looks like they're experiencing a lot of anxiety or that they're really sad and that person is your friend then uh, you are likely to provide them with some support because they apparently need it. So you go up and ask them, hey are you feeling okay? Is there anything I can do? Anything I can help you with? You look really stressed out. And so uh, to some extent just expressing your emotions can be healthy because it lets other people know that maybe they should cut you some slack or give you some help. It elicits that social support. Now, one, ex one big exception to this is, uh, involves anger. So, is anyone familiar with the catharsis hypothesis? Mm -hmm. So, what is, what is the catharsis hypothesis say, roughly? Basically when you feel angry, you let out that anger with like, the playing a violent video game or listening to my body, it's supposed to like help with the stress. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's the basic idea with the catharsis hypothesis, is that if you keep your anger bottled up, then uh, that's, not healthy and you need to let it out and just rage every once in a while. Uh, but uh, research has shown that that hypothesis is actually totally backwards and that people who express a lot of anger and vent to try to reduce their anger, um, they're not very good at coping with subsequent frustrations and feelings of anger. And also, uh, when people really rage and get angry, uh, it can upset the other people around them, which can just lead to a bad situation overall. And so, this thing that I've just talked about regarding emotional inhibition uh, is most applicable to feeling sad or stressed or anxious, but not angry. Uh, so, with anger, it's actually best to uh, just exercise self-control and uh, you can do something nice for other people. So there's this do good, feel good phenomenon. So if you're feeling angry, just do, do someone a favor and then they'll be nice to you in return and that'll make you feel good. So there's just different ways of dealing with anger compared to stress. All right, any questions about that? All right. So uh, disclosure is also something that can be healthy. So when someone has a really rough secret that's causing them a lot of stress, just keeping it a secret, uh, that can result in some negative psychological consequences. And it can also have negative consequences for your health. Now, of course, if you go around just telling a lot of secrets all the time, that can come with its own group of problems. <laughs> and so this is actually the major benefit of uh, psychological therapy, is uh, you have someone to talk to who uh, is really obligated to keep your secrets. They have that doctor-patient confidentiality. So a lot of times, if you have a close friend who you can talk to uh, and just share some secret things with, that can produce a lot of psychological benefits. Um, another strategy that people use that can have some of the same positive effects is to just keep a diary or a journal. And just writing these things down that are weighing heavily on your mind can help you to deal with them a lot better, but uh, of course therapy can help as well. It all has to do with disclosure. So uh, the last thing that we'll talk about today, because I know we're running a little short on time, 
is uh, this relationship between type A personality and heart disease. So I've mentioned this briefly before. But, uh, you see this uh, in, in certain people who are really highly motivated. So uh, we've mentioned that one aspect of the type A personality is this competitive achievement motivation. So it's the, also referred to as the play to win mentality. So if they're not going to be successful in everything that they do, they don't want to bother doing it. The only purpose of playing a game is to win. These folks don't make the best losers. Mm -hmm. uh, they also experience a lot of time urgency. So uh, they're more likely to do things like wear a watch and monitor uh, deadlines. They're very punctual and they hate anything that causes them a delay, like uh, traffic lights, long lines. They get really, really frustrated. I think I might be a little type A myself. <laughs> uh, and then finally, there's this component of hostility. So when one of their goals gets blocked, like they lose, or like I was talking about here, something causes them a delay and they're late, uh, they can respond with a lot of aggression. So uh, research has shown that this hostility is really the lethal component. <coughs> so that's what's most strongly associated with having uh, heart disease. Now, there's kind of an interesting side note about the measurement of hostility in these type A individuals. Um, as I've mentioned in here many, many times, most personality assessments rely on self-reports, and we've spent quite a while talking about the limitations of self-reports. Uh, and so that also applies to trying to measure hostility. Uh, it's just hard to measure this with questionnaires for all the reasons we've talked about. So it's, people know that it's not socially desirable to respond in a hostile way. So if you ask someone, how irritated do you get with traffic or with stoplights, uh, they'll probably report being less irritated than they actually are they have a high degree of hostility. And so they really only find this link between uh, type A personality and heart disease using a structured interview technique. So rather than just providing someone with a pencil and paper and saying, answer these questions, in a structured interview you have a trained observer who's conducting the interview and they'll actually ask the person all of the relevant questions. And then they're trained to record what the person says, their actual answer, but also to record their reaction to the questions. So uh, some people might get a little bit frustrated because the questions seem to be taking a long time and they'll have a hostile uh, manner that they'll use when they're interacting with the interviewer. And so trained observers know how to quantify this and they can record it. And then, like I said, it's using that technique that they really find that uh, relationship between type A personality and increased incidence of heart disease. So, any questions about this? All right, well, we're done for the day. Have a good Thanksgiving break. And uh, I'll see you all in a week.